Welcome to iLecture Online, and here's an introduction to the LC circuit. An LC circuit is a simple circuit that only has a capacitor and an inductor in it. And when that happens, if, for example, you put some charge on a capacitor and you connect it to an inductor like this, what's going to happen is that the current is going to go through the inductor to the other side and then go back to this side and back to this side and back to this side. And Consequently, what's going to happen is you're going to build up some energy on the capacitor, then build up some energy across the conductor, inductor, back to capacitor, back to inductor, and so you're going to have like an oscillating current back and forth between these two. If this is a perfect circuit, this could go on forever because there would not be any energy loss because there's no resistance on the circuit. Of course, that's only in theory. In real life, any inductor, any uh, circuit will always have some sort of resistance, but if we think of this as a purely theoretical circuit with no resistance at all, this would continue on forever. So what we're trying to do here is find the charge on the capacitor as a function of time. And the way to do that is as follows. First of all, we take the definition of capacitance, which is equal to the charge on the capacitor, Q, divided by the voltage. So in this time, since small q represents the charge as a function of time, let's just put it like that, then we can say that the charge, in this case, um, or the voltage across the capacitor, which def is defined as Q over C, then the voltage as a function of time is equal to Q as a function of time divided by the capacitance. With the inductor, the voltage drop across the inductor depends upon the change of current as a function of time. So we can say that the voltage across the inductor is equal to L times di dt. Of course, there's a negative there normally, but we'll just say the absolute value of the voltage across the inductor is equal to that. So now if we use Kirchhoff's rule and go completely around the circle and try to figure out what the sum of the voltages are, and of course remember that the sum of the voltages across any loop is equal to zero, in this case, going across the capacitor, the voltage is going to be Q over C, minus Q over C because it's a voltage drop, and across the inductor is going to be minus L di dt. If we then go a little step further and realize that the definition of I, the current, is equal to uh, dq dt, we can replace I by dq dt over here, and then this equation becomes zero is equal to minus Q over C minus L times the second derivative of Q with respect to time. Remember, since I is dQ dt, and if you take the derivative of that, di dt, you get d squared Q dt squared. All right, now if I multiply both sides by negative sign and rearrange the terms, I get 0 is equal to L d squared Q dt squared plus Q over C. And now if I divide both sides equation by L, I get 0 is equal to d squared Q dt squared plus um, let's say 1 over LC times Q. Let's write it like that. Here notice that the Q is the variable, which is what we're looking for, the charge on the capacitor is a function of time. And um, it's, um, it looks a lot like an equation we've seen before. The equation we've seen before, the one with the oscillating spring, has the differential equation where you have 0 is equal to d x square dt square plus k over m times x. So this was the differential equation that, that illustrated or that represented the oscillating spring with x was the displacement of, this, of the spring or the mass of the spring, m was the mass on the spring and k was the spring constant of the spring. So you can see that here what determines what happens in the circuit is the inductance and the capacitors, not the spring constant and the mass. And the variable that we're dealing with here is Q, the charge, instead of X, the distance covered. But the equation looks exactly the same. So the general solution to this equation is that the, the charge, Q, as a function of time, is equal to A times either the sine or the cosine of the function, but typically they use the cosine of the function here, cosine of omega t plus the phase angle. The phase angle is only there if you don't start at a particular location at t equals zero. So for simplification, we can just kind of leave out the phase angle for now. So we're just going to write Q as a function of time is equal to A times the cosine of omega t. 
Now, what are A and what is omega in this case? Well, A represents the largest value that Q can be, which is the total charge that we can place on the capacitor. So this equation, Q as a function of time, can be written as the total charge we can place on the capacitor at the instant that time goes, times the cosine of omega. Now, omega, by definition, 1 over the square root of LC. So omega is equal to 1 over the square root of LC, just like in this equation, omega was equal to the square root of K over M. And so that would be a cosine of omega, which would be 1 over the square root of LC times time plus the phase angle, although in this case I'm just simply going to leave out the phase angle, so we'll just write it like that. So that is the charge as a function of time. Now, what is omega equal to in this case? Well, omega is equal to 1 over the square root of LC, so let's calculate that. So this is equal to 1 over the square root of the inductance, which is 0.5, multiplied times the capacitance, which is 8 microfarads, which is 8 times 10 to the minus 6. And so let's figure out what that is equal to. Where's my calculator? Here we go. So we have 8e to the 6 minus times 0.5 equals, take the square root of that, Okay, so this is equal to 1 over 2 times 10 to the minus 3. And if we take the inverse of that, that is equal to 500 omega. Now, omega represents the number of radians per second. So that's equal to radians per second, like so. Now, remember that the relationship between radians per second omega and frequency can be written like this. Omega is equal to 2 pi f, which means that the frequency of oscillation is equal to omega divided by 2 pi. In this case, omega was 500 radians per second. And we divide that by 2 pi radians per oscillation, if you want to call it that, oscillation. Let's just write in oscillation like this. OK, so this is equal to. 500 divided by 2 divided by pi equals, looks like just about 80 oscillations per second. Okay, now, using the numbers that we have in our example, we came up with an equation that described the charge on the capacitor as a function of time. Of course, you can have a phase angle in there if you like. We discover what Omega is equal to, that's 500 radians per second, and turn into frequency of oscillation, it's 80 oscillations per second, which means that in this particular circuit, once we load up a certain amount of charge in the capacitor, that 80 times per second, the charge would go back and forth, back and forth on this, on this circuit. And it would do that, of course, forever, unless there's some resistance to dampen that. In a future example, I will go ahead and put a resistor in there and show you how then over time, an example like this, that the oscillations would dampen and eventually stop. But while that's happening, it would go back and forth like that 80 times per second. Okay, now, how much charge is on there per unit time? So if you want to figure that out, then you use this right here. We have 1 over LC. So let's plug in what 1 over LC is equal to. That is equal to 500. So we can say that as a function of time in our example, charge as a function of time. Let me get out of your way so you can see what we're doing here is equal to the total charge that we put on the capacitor at time equals zero. We multiply that times the cosine of omega. Omega is 500 radians per second times time. And so ignoring the phase angle, that will tell you how much charge you have on a capacitor at any point in time in this particular example. And that's how you do that problem.